Let's kick things off with Mike, who's in Edmonton. Hi there. Hi, Mark and David. Um, when I buy stocks, I normally plan to hold for seven years plus to ride out the negative cycles and hoping the, the world isn't going to end eventually. And I was looking at um, Agrium, EGU, and from my analysis, I looks like it's uh, good value. I'm thinking around 30% under price. Um, and I also have a heard your introductory comments, and I do have a lot of conservative stocks like utilities as well. So I just appreciate your comments on the riskier stocks for a long-term time horizon. Sure. Thank sure. you. Um, so, Mike, just off the top, I heard a great, great comment this morning, and it was talking about equities and, and you know, do, is there value in equities today? And certainly there's lots of short-term risks, but in the simplest of terms, if you bought the S&P 500 today, the S&P 500 yielding about 3%. And so if you compared that to buying a 10-year bond, paying it two, you're, you're making the assumption that there will be no dividend increases or no earnings growth for the next 10 years, and you still come out ahead. So ultimately, probably stocks are, are not bad value for a longer-term investor. It's just you have to be able to deal with the shorter-term you know, issues in the, in the meantime. Uh, I talked at the beginning about picking your spots and finding things that really are working now. And one of the very few areas, I think, that are productive currently in equity markets are, are those companies that are, are most associated with agriculture, uh, and specifically those that, that benefit from higher prices. Corn and wheat prices have been quite strong, uh, and the yields are coming in a little bit under what had been hoped for. So the fertilizer companies make a lot of sense. And in the fertilizer camp, the nitrogen producers are most interesting because they're specifically more focused at the, at the corn producers. So Agrium falls into that camp. Uh, so uh, I don't own Agrium currently. I would buy the stock. Uh, they beat the most recent estimate by about 8%. Uh, stock's been hanging in extremely well against a very tough market. And there's very few stocks that have been holding up against this tough tape. Uh, and uh, so this is one that I think that you could look at. Uh, and we do think that longer term agriculture is a, is a good place to be. And uh, I do think that as we get through the fall, based on many, many of the measures we look at, uh, market's getting pretty sold out, uh, and while there can still be some choppiness and, and we can still probe the downside a bit, ultimately you probably get some kind of fourth quarter rally along the way, and, and I think that the, uh, the ag stocks would really, really uh, participate well. What's your favorite agricultural play right now? Well, in this space, we own CF Industries, uh, which uh, I think is a little bit better positioned. That Agrium tried to buy. Yeah, and, and, and Agrium, you know, but Agrium has uh, a more diversified base. Uh, and it's less specifically just fertilizer. And, uh, I, but I, I, I would have no problem owning Agrium. I also own some potash. Uh, and um, it's one of the few industries we're focused in right now. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we've got Jim in Whitefish, Ontario. Citigroup was very sour on natural gas today, saying prices will continue to be bleak. Uh, Jim wants to know about Encana. Go ahead. Mark, uh, David, uh, Encana, uh, how do you know, analysts tell you to buy in a pullback. How do you know it's a pullback or just pending bad news? Thank you. Well, you know, Jim, it's a, it's a very good question because there's multiple sources of return. When you buy a stock, you get impacted by what the market's doing, and certainly that's been tougher. You get impacted by the sector, uh, which certainly natural gas as a, as a neighborhood has been a tough neighborhood to be in given all the gas has been found. And then you've got company-specific issues. But that's company-specific is probably only about 20% of return, especially when you're looking in the more near term. So in energy, we, we now have gone from what was an overweight position in energy in the spring to a pretty small weight. We're only about 8% energy all in, and that includes some midstream energy assets. The producers we own uh, are almost non-existent, but what we do own are more oily uh, and and generally have a, some kind of a yield attached to them. So in Canada has a 3.5% yield, I think that's attractive, but it's natural gas largely. And uh, seasonally, this is the time when you might see them get a little bit better. But the stock just is not responding. Yesterday made a new low for the year. And largely, if you look at the big, big uh, integrated producers in Canada, they're behaving terribly, whether you're looking at Suncor and Canada, any number of them. So. I, I think that there are risks out there that I would, I would just prefer to stay away from in the, in the short run. If you're going to buy a producer, buy one with a bigger yield attached. 
Um, uh, but even then, I think that there's some risk. We prefer the midstream assets in energy. And you're not the type of investor to in invest in something waiting for it to turn around. You like momentum. Well, our clients are private investors. Our private investors expect to participate in the things that are working. Uh, if I tell them they'll make money over the next five years, but they have to wait till year five, they will fire me along the way. <laughs> in fairness, you know, uh, private investors ultimately do have some emotion attached. And uh, I think that long run, uh, uh, natural gas probably will do well at some point. You know, we hear lots of rumblings about new infrastructure being built for liquefied natural gas and use in trucking and all of those things. But there, I think that's a long way down the road. So I would prefer to give up the first little bit of return, wait and see something changing in the marketplace, see the sector get engaged, see the stock start to perform better, and then participate at that point because you can wait a long time uh, as a value investor for other folks to recognize the value. Right. All right, here's an email from Wayne in Richmond Hill, Ontario on Microsoft. What is uh, David's view on this company? Is it a buy, a sell, or a hold at these levels? Here's a company that's kind of gone, at least the stock has gone sort of sideways for 10 years, right? Yeah. Do you like so, it? So, so this is not the type of stock we tend to buy. We tend to buy the, the, the higher growth businesses, especially if we're looking at technology. But I would say that technically these stocks, the big ones, the big tech stocks, all topped out around 2000 and have been going through a multiple compression since then. In other words, the market's been willing to pay a lower and lower multiple of earnings as the growth rates remain slow, low. But Microsoft has really grown its earnings. Uh, next year they're expected to earn something like $2.85 a share. In 2000 it was under a buck. Um, it pays uh, a 2.5% dividend. It's going to be an underperformer if technology gets going, <clears throat> but the risk level is extremely low. They got tons of cash on the balance sheet, and yes, their their various franchises are under some assault. Um, but uh, the earnings should be growing, and the earnings multiple is very low. So for a value investor, somebody who isn't trying to knock it over the fence, probably Microsoft might not be a bad bet. We don't own it currently, though. All right, fair enough. We'll take a short break here with David Burroughs, and we'll get back to your calls and emails on North American large caps after this. Twenty, forty.